Um, welcome to everybody who's joined us and the session will be recorded so that uh, anybody who doesn't join on time or people who aren't able to join now will be able to watch it later. Um, this is going to be the first Governing Intimacies webinar that I am hosting. Normally we have uh, Professor Srila Roy, who is the principal investigator, the head of the Governing Intimacies program. Uh, she would facilitate this, but she's on holiday, which is lovely for her um, and a lovely opportunity for me and for Kayo. Um, we have, I think, a really important and interesting uh, pair of discussions today, which are going to explore something, an aspect of intimacy and governing intimacies that we haven't yet had a chance to discuss during the time of lockdown and pandemic. Uh, my name is Nahama Brody, and I uh, am at Witz University in Johannesburg and also a part of the Governing Intimacies program. And together with me today is also Kayo Araujo, who's um, also part of Governing Intimacies. Kayo will be facilitating the questions at the end of the session. Mm -hmm. And I want to introduce our two phenomenal um, panelists, speakers today. Um, and once again, I'm always so excited when we have the South Africa Indian pairing or Southern African Indian pairing, because it always highlights just the resonances between our two spaces. Um, and I always learn so much from listening to them. Um, so today in our session on um, sacred and spiritual spaces, we have um, Atrey Majumder, who is a, a Associate Professor of Sociology and Anthropology at Jindal University in, uh, in Sonipat in India. Um, she's a historical and political anthropologist. Um, and her book, uh, most recent book is Time, Space and Capital, Longing and Belonging in an Urban Industrial Hinterland that came out in 2018 with Routledge. Um, we also have uh, Lorena Nunez Carrasco, who is based at Witz University in Johannesburg. She's a medical anthropologist and is in the Department of Sociology. And she's currently researching the South African response to COVID-19 and its impact on vulnerable groups, which is a, a project funded by Governing Intimacies and by the National Research Foundation in South Africa. Um, Lorena and Atre are gonna be talking about quite different but really connected aspects of the sacred, the divine, the spiritual, the intimate um, in very different places, but I think there's a commonality there. What we're going to, the format for today's webinar will be that uh, Atre and then Lorena will each um, talk for about sort of 10 to 12 minutes on their topic. Then we'll have a short little session where they'll talk to each other. And after that, we're gonna open it up to questions from everybody who is watching. And you can post your questions in the side chat if you want to, although it might be easier to use the Q&A function. Um, on the side, and I can see already Kevin has uh, cleverly added a, a question. Can you put the books and links in the chat? Um, absolutely, I'll post the title of Atre's book now in the chat on the side. And if anybody wants to have a conversation on the side, please use your, your chat function there for that and easier to use the Q&A for, for questions. Um, I'm going to ask Atre to start and uh, I'm gonna switch off my no, actually I'll keep my camera on, otherwise you're just gonna get this weird blank kind of thing looking at it. Um, and uh, Atre, the floor is, or the screen is now yours. Thank you, Nehama. Uh, did I pronounce that right? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I wanna thank, begin by thanking Srila Roy, uh, who's a, a friend and colleague, uh, and has uh, very generously invited me to several governing intimacies uh, events last year in Delhi and, and this time online uh it's a, it's a, i'm missing her today but i'm also very very glad to meet the the other lot uh nehama uh, kayo and lorena um i'm welcome everyone who's online today who's taking the time uh, to come come online and listen to us uh, i have exactly 10 minutes so i won't go on about uh, my welcome remarks my paper today is titled governing divine intimacy uh, it's a paper that's a very personal paper. It's part of a longer project that where I'm trying to first pass apart my spiritual devotee self and my ethnographer self. And the two go together in this project. Uh, this project is located in Vrindavan in the Braj, traditionally what is called the Braj region, the sacred geography of Krishna worship in Northern India. And in this paper, I'm trying to pass apart in, in, in this particular iteration of the paper today, I'm trying to pass apart three, three 
possible uh, aspects of the self. One, the devotee. Two, the ethnographer. Three, the secular citizen. And uh, I'm going to read bits of the paper. In Vrindavan, I started to learn to experience joy, some version of Ananda that is spoken of in the Gita, at intuiting Krishna's presence. The simultaneous act of conducting research was complicated by the conduct of my own religious practice. In describing this complication, I wish to mark out the central problem of conducting ethnography of devotion while being a devotee. I started to travel through the split subjectivity of the ethnographer as they are trying to gather data on worship while consuming the ambience of God as a, as a devotee herself. In this paper, I ponder on the ambivalences of being a devotee, a secular citizen, and an ethnographer at the same time. What happens when the doing and the watching of ethnography diverge in consequence? I realize that this is the primary definition of whatever form participant observation may take. In its actual literal doing, this kind of participant observation hits upon a real conundrum, whether to immerse in the doing or the watching. If the two have to diverge, I must admit, I suspect I will deliver two very different ethnographies. This conundrum, in my case, maps onto the simultaneous habitation of multiple selves in devotion, in research, and in the mandate of being a secular citizen of India. One evening, Radha Kanta, the e rickshaw driver, e rickshaws are these battery operated three wheeler um, vehicles that op operate all over small towns in India, and e rickshawala. Um, suggested I watch the Arati or the evening offering to Yamunaji, the Yamuna River, at sunset. This is in Vrindavan. We arrived at a point where the e rickshaw could not go any further. I walked the rest of the way on stone paved ghat, ghats of quail, uh, along the murky river to reach the ghat where the preparation for Arati had already begun. I sat precariously on the steps, huddling against my cloth bag because I had been warned my belongings may be attacked by monkeys. I was asked by one of the men to go and join the line of women who were sitting at the edge of the ghat ready to offer flowers to the river. I said I didn't want to go right down to the edge because it was too cold there. This was February 2019. The real reason was that I was afraid to look down at the river from the precarious parts of the ghat, a kind of vertigo that I was experiencing. The women, in their saris and exposed bellies, did not seem to be bothered by the cold. They were taking instructions from the patriarch priest sitting at their center. The priest had his hair tied up in a bun on top of his head. He wore a down jacket and a white dhoti. He looked severe. I would not dare approach him. The mantra chanting and the flower offering went on simultaneously. They lined up behind the priest afterwards. I joined the queue and we threw pieces of kneaded flour dough into the waters of the Yamuna. Then the bra grand brass lamp was lit. It had many levels. Each level contained a number of diyas or small lamps. The senior women were given small lamp holders, which were very, still very elaborate ones. Other women, me and a Caucasian woman included, were given metal plates with a lamp each. The priest slowly started dancing with the massive lamp. Another man who looked like a locally powerful person stepped forth and took the lamp holder from him. He held obviously the obviously heavy and hot object with an orange cloth and discontinued the dance. It was a show of masculine power and resilience. These men were entitled to lift this massive brass lamp holder in offering homage to Sri Yamunaji or the Yamuna River. Stuck to the walls of the ghat, there was a massive poster that declared solidarity towards the Indian CRPF soldiers who had died in the terrorist attack in Pulwama in Kashmir the day before. It was Valentine's Day. This scene was filled with material provocation from the senses, for the senses. Fire, camphor, flowers, and water. This assembly was offering respect to a much ecologically damaged river. This sensory provocation was simultaneously declaring sovereignty over a religious community and a nation state. Sensory provocation seemed to be at the core of faith. A huge poster was stuck by the side of the ghat, declaring allegiance to the Hindu fight for nationhood. This was the evening of the recent Pulwanama attack on the Indian soldiers by the Jaish-e-Muhammad terrorist outfit. 
sovereignty was displayed here in the name of Sri Krishna, also known as Kanhaya, Govardhan ji, Giridhar ji, Banke Bihari ji. This is Vrindavan, the sacred territory of Lord Krishna. This is where he is believed to have been raised simply among a community of cowherds, the Yadavas. He is worshipped by various sects here in a parental capacity. The devotee acts like a parent to the god, like the god is a child, baby Krishna, and the devotee is a parent. The devotees take on the mantle of being parents of parental figures, helping raise a mischievous butter stealing kanhaya. They chant Hati Ghoda Pal Ki Jai Kanhaya Lal Ki. Le elephants, horses, and sedans glory to the child Krishna. This territory belongs to Krishna and his devotees. I entered this space as a devotee and as an ethnographer. This led me into a bit of trouble. My sensory provocation and associated defeat at the hands of God went simultaneously with the rational compulsion to study as a researcher, remaining constantly aware and watching until those faculties started failing. Krishna is indeed the carrier and the declarer of sovereign authority to this day in the second territory of Raj, the five towns, Vrindavan, Mathura, Gokul, Barsana, and Nandagaon. In Krishna's name, this land was bestowed with the imagination of simple cowherd life or loving parents or Leela between the adult Krishna and Radha, his primary lover, surrounded by gopis, his other lover. Leela is a kind of Yui San. Krishna's play, Haberman calls it, David Haberman calls it, calls it purposeless play, where he purposefully makes himself an innocent child or a young cowherd to play with his subject population. His mother Yashoda and his primary lover Radha assert power over him. Thus, they too are interpolated in the version of Pantheon in these temples strewn all over the Braj region. This animation of play and acting in various capacities to the baby or young Krishna forms the core of worship here. A priest at Banke Bihari temple tells me, we don't follow very rigid procedures for puja or worship. We simply enact bhava, which means mood or essence. We take care of the deity as we would a little child. We pull the curtains from over the deity from time to time, just as we would a little child. You wouldn't want anyone to stare at the child. It wouldn't bring him nazar. The, the worship strides in anthropomorphization of divinity to, to the point of extreme detail. The devotee exercises several roles of extreme gentleness and care as a parent, villager, neighbor, cousin, lover to Krishna. And yet the same devotee protects the rights of Krishna to rule over his territory in warlike affect. This warlike defensive affect wedged with the outfit of the political right wing that wears the garb of what is called Hindutva. Storytelling brings a live presence of the Godhead amidst this mundane landscape of small towns. It makes possible the enchantment of the entire region with the presence of the Godhead, not confined only to physical materiality of the deity in the temple. A priest in Gokul points to the garden sur surrounding a temple and says, this is where Krishna danced in the form of a peacock on the request of his followers. I was amused. Of course, I didn't believe that Krishna danced here dressed as a peacock. But I believe Krishna was here and was here and will be here. I detected his presence everywhere. Why then do the stories told by priests and other religious leaders evoke in me amused suspicion? Why this superior hermeneutic of suspicion? I traveled to Gokul in an auto rickshaw from Vrindavan. The auto driver told, took me to a place not quite the Gokul I had been to earlier. He said, this is old Gokul. I walked through a maze of old cobbled alleys with little shrines on both sides and brightly colored multiple pa multi panels, ancient looking doors and windows. My impulse was to take photographs of these doors and windows. I was hesitant because I had been told mon monkeys could again snatch your phone. Um, I ended up at the entrance of a temple called Panchayati Mandir Sri Nanda Bhavan Swamba. There was florists waiting outside and I bought 10 rupees worth of flowers. I went in with a big group of devotees. They were instructed about, they were being instructed about conduct inside the inner quarters as I read. The instructor had instructed everyone to enter crawling, not, not standing up, crawling, literally on all fours. We crawled in uncomfortably shuffling into a spot where the devotee would be in our line of vision. We sat in a low stone quarter facing the devotee. A man spoke in Hindi in the microphone. His words were not legible to me except for the intermittent charts of Papa Paya Chale Kanaya, Hachi Gora Palki, Jay Kanaya Lalki. In, 
intermittently people were asked to throw their hands in the air and laugh to display that they had no worries in the house of god then they declared that they could people could contribute towards gaudan which means gift of cow uh, by contributing to these 1155 1155 he kept saying there is no pressure give the gift only if it pleases if it causes you any financial or other difficulty don't give despite this subtle pressure despite this there was such subtle pressure on everyone after they put up their hands to offer a gift the instructor came over to me and asked them their names and their fathers their mothers wives older sons names and called these names out loudly they were given agya or permission to visit the four pilgrimage sites char char dham badrinath nathwara and two others the assumption of course was that every adult is married and has children i sat in discomfort i had come here to immerse myself in the world of religion in good faith but now religion was exposing its naked economic logic that day i came back to the hotel feeling very irritated with the same religious establishment which had provided me earlier with extreme feelings of love and devotion how was i to reconcile these contradictory feelings secularism and its anchoring of my life provides an explanation i had technically left behind secularism in my journey towards krishna but my secularism call it agnosticism if you will pulled me back it is an emotional home that i constantly look back on in my journey towards krishna in this strange side trope of accepting religion as a way to detect the divine presence in everyday life religion gave me a set of tools it also took me towards a set of people whose logic i find difficult to decipher why poor people from bilwara would readily submit to priestly pressure to give large sums of money for gaudan or gift of cow was incomprehensible to me they could have politely resisted and remained still remained attached to the godhead like i was trying to do but no they didn't find it in themselves to dispute the priest suggestion they did not unlike me look with lenses of superior suspicion upon the inner workings of religion and especially their economic logic i was looking to immerse myself in contemplation of the godhead without the messy and hierarchical reality of organized religion this bifurcation would allow me to be a religious to be religious without cutting out my secular liberal sensibilities to a certain extent my secular persona was intervening in this immersion and pulling me back into suspicious reasoning an ethnographic puzzle starts to emerge in this puzzle thank you Thank you so much, Atre. It's so many things to think about there. And I'm also, I'm trying to like teasing threads of sort of normality and the idea of monkeys threatening every sort of level of the spiritual, the exploration of these otherwise sacred spaces, which, um, but we will talk about that in a moment. We're now going to move on to our, our next speaker to Lorena and um, uh, I'll stop there because otherwise I'll talk more. Um, Lorena, please go ahead. The floor is now yours. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay. In this presentation, I want to discuss some of the intangible effects of the COVID-19 pandemic in the morning of death. I have recently conducted research with bereaved families, burial societies, and funeral parlors to understand how they have lived their death during COVID times. This work is also informed by the reflection pieces written by 200 medical students, students at WITS as one of their assignments in a health sociology course. They had to write about the impact of COVID in their communities. In their account, accounts, it became clear funerals were lived with a great sense of loss. Not only the loss of the person that was not longer there, but the loss of the possibility to properly mourn that loss. South Africa is a culturally diverse society and also one of the most unequal societies in the world. Has it had been clearly shown the imposition of lockdown and other COVID-19 related restrictions have deepened South Africans' fault lines of class, gender and race. I want to suggest that the restrictions imposed on the management of human remains and the proceedings around funerals and burials might have well been an equalizer. On the whole, these regulations and restrictions have deeply altered customary and religious prescriptions on the management of dead body. 
bodies for everybody. And as a consequence, I will argue these restrictions have impacted on experiences of mourning across the diverse cultural and religious last landscape of, the can of this country. This has been uh, the case across the world and throughout South Africa, yet in each community, this is lived differently. I will only refer here to the Christian and African traditions, including that of repatriation of bodies for burial purposes in the, to Zimbabwe, practice that is common among Southern African migrants. Um, I will briefly men mention uh, the South African regulations on the management of human remains. South Africa imposed restrictions on the handling and transportation of mortal remains along with the general COVID restrictions. One of the first imposed measures was the closure of all ports of entry, which immediately put at a halt to international movements and the repatriation of bodies was placed under stringent guidelines. The transport between provinces for any purpose, including funeral, was also interrupted. New guidelines on the handling of mortal remains at home and in mortuaries ruled that an airtight body bag had to be used for transferring COVID-19 mortal remains to the mortuary and personnel handling it should use PPE, personal uh, protection equipment, and later remove and dispose of disinfect equipment used in the process. When a, when a person passed on at home, family members should not touch the body as this became a responsibility of emergency medical services. They require the, the use of PPE for the handling of, of the belonging of the deceased. Funeral undertakers will deliver the body to the family on the morning of the burial, burial and had to ensure that COVID-19 positive bodies were not touched. For non-COVID-19 related death, body viewing was to be done only in hospitals or mortuaries under strict conditions of wearing gloves and masks with family members taking turns to view the body to avoid crowding. Only a limited number of people could attend funerals and particularly in case of COVID-19 related death, only close relatives were allowed to attend the funeral and body viewing was not allowed. The repatriation of bodies was permitted yet under several restrictions issued by South Africa and Zimbabwean governments, making the process of repatriation more cumbersome than usual. A key rule in this regulation was that only vehicles designated and certified to carry dead bodies were allowed to transport uh, the, the deceased bodies. These restrictions had uh, an immediate effect. Zimbabwean newspapers reported that while under normal circumstances, 60 bodies would be repatriated through the Bay Bridge border post every week, only six bodies were repatriated in the first week of April as a result of these rules. Zimbabwean government uh, new regulations treated all bodies entering the country as contagious. Exceptions to this rule were a natural death. The new rules involved that grieving families and relatives who wished to accompany the body to Zimbabwe were required to be quarantined for 21 days on arrival at the border before proceeding to the funeral. Effectively, this was an in indirect way of preventing relatives of deceased families uh, from accompanying the body of their loved ones across the border to Zimbabwe. Typically, uh, around 25 people would accompany the body in the journey back home. During the journey, family and friends, depending on the religion of the family, would perform rituals along the way. They will stop, they would do the rituals and carry on, and on the other side of the border, they would do another ritual, says Bishop Ndebele. And the COVID restrictions, only a driver is authorized to transport the body, hence no rituals are performed. And Bishop says, people are stressing because they, they're not doing the rituals due to COVID. Some of them believe that when they die, everyone needs to be there, the family, the elders, the neighbors. And now you'll find that when somebody dies, the wife is alone in South Africa. So they take the body back to Zimbabwe and the wife remains alone. 
Bodies are sent off without the personal belonging. In normal time, there is a dedicated trailer that carries the belonging of the deceased. I spoke to one of the authorized drivers who took the responsibility to travel with the body of a friend back to Bulawayo, 900 kilometers away from Johannesburg. He had to do all by himself. He had, if he had a breakdown along the route, it would have been a problem, he says. While the body is in embalmed, it is uh, not supposed to take longer uh, than three days to the destination. And he only had four days to complete the journey and be back. However, what he found most difficult was, the, was to deal with a bereaved family. And he says, families are a challenge because some of them, they want to come, definitely. They don't want to accept they can't go along. And they, and they didn't trust I would manage to do it on my own. They were worried that nobody would speak to the body. That uh, is what people believe. Some people, what they believe is that, no, our brother, if he goes alone, he won't sleep warm. That's what they believe. They say we'll have to park somewhere and talk to him so he goes nicely. And I ask, uh, did you did you do all of that? And he said, no, I didn't do anything. I'm a Jehovah witness. They were so heartbroken, he said, when I left. Some of them even collapsed at, at the funeral parlor. Some of the family member, members even escorted me for 70 kilometers to the limit of the province where there was a roadblock as people were not allowed to cross to another province without a letter. They left me there and took pictures at the garage before we depart ways. He, he, he was 45 years old and he had a wife and children this side in South Africa. And while he was living in South Africa for long, they still decided to take him back because the family believed the elders need, need him there. The family were phoning me uh, all the way along, even at the South African border. I was telling them I was doing this or that, even in Zim. I had to go straight to the funeral parlor. I was telling them what, I was, what, I was, what was happening. Uh, the families in Bulawayo were waiting for me. Mr. Chuma, the, direct, the director of one of the oldest uh, so, burial, burial societies in Johannesburg, with 800 members, mostly Zimbabweans from Matavele and South, reflects on how difficult this has been for the families of the deceased. Normally in funerals, he says, the family feels supported when they see the car and the members of the burial society wearing the uniforms ready to accompany them across the border, something that is not possible, possibly now. In the burial of our members, he adds, there is no dignity now. We are just sending the body like as if this person never was part of a burial society. You are sending a dead the dead person with a driver, that, that is all, because we used to accompany the body. We bring the body to the parents and we hand it over to them. Right now, you know, as Africans, we have that. The dead person has to be respected, but there is not respect now. This thing of sending the body alone, is, this is not in our society. This is like there is no respect. Sorry to say, for, for me, it's like we are burying a dog. We can't do what we are here to do, provide burial with dignity. While regulations were set, set up to prevent uh, the, the highly contagious virus, the, the coronavirus, this have, uh, the spread of this con highly contagious virus, these have at the same time entered into the space of the sacred. I would argue with no clear attention on the potential implications of such eruption. It is not clear yet what are the long-term implications of this rupture. Here, I want to highlight some of the ambits in which the regulations around dead bodies during COVID-19 have trespassed the sacred. First and foremost, these regulations have taken the ownership of the dead body. These bodies do not belong anymore to the bereaved family and the management of the death is not anymore their prerogative. This is now regulated by the state in the name of public health. If this was necessary, yeah, 
Well, yes, but that no, is not the question. What I want to do is to call the attention on the intangible effect of the ruling of the state to restrict access and isolate the death body, a body that has now become a contagious, a dangerous body. It is not the body of the life that was. The state has interfered, interfered with the possibility to create and preserve a space of intimacy with the death body. Mourning requires intimacy among the living and with the death body, and intimacy involves the senses. How to mourn is the possibility of engaging the senses, the sight, the touch, is not longer there. The viewing of the body, touching of the body, the washing of the body, the dressing of the body. What is, this, what is lost when this is not possible? What is left in, inconclusive? What do we do with the care that we could not give to the dead? The visual and sensorial engagement with the dead body, often done in a cultural and religious prescribed manner, has been altered and altered as a result of the COVID restrictions. The COVID-19 regulations have obstructed the possibility to create a space of intimacy, to conduct a ritual, to pause, to contemplate, to remember, to share, to mourn, to cry the loss on somebody's arm, arms, to comfort, to hug and kiss, to hold hands, to shake hands, to properly say goodbye. We are left with these intangible consequences of COVID-19 among us and with the challenge to think about what could have been done differently, how to introduce regulations that are cognizant what is required to properly mourn. That is cool. That's a very powerful and actually really hard to listen to in many parts because I, I, you know, outside of it, viewing it through the lens of media reports or the way people report on regulations, it's easy to forget about the human experience. And I really think that that is what today's discussion is about. And so importantly, through two spaces, um, which is one is through the lens of the researcher and the location, the positionality, physical positionality and you know, other positionality of the researcher themselves, and then the, the subjects, the topic being explored here. Um, very human uh, stories. So what we're going to move to now, um, Atre and Lorena, if you, can, if you have any questions for each other. Um, one thing that also did occur to me in very different ways, but Atre, you mentioned suspicion coming up a few times and Lorena was talking about this dangerous body and I felt how interesting it was that in these different completely different sacred and spiritual spaces and realms that that element of danger and suspicion was still there um, but uh, Atre and Lorena I'll open it up to both of you now you can respond and talk to each other I don't know if any who wants to start can I speak uh, hi, Lorena, that was uh, very, very powerful, and I'm still uh, internalizing what you said. Um, I, I, my first question is, is to you is, um, is there an economy of suspension of sexuality? Um, so, so, of course, a, a, a dead body is treated with um, various rituals which make it sacred, which make death sacred. But when sacrality is not possible, is there a counter ritual? And is there a ritual economy there which is possible when the sacral sacralization of the dead body is not possible? And secondly, um, what then um, from this work can we infer about the philosophy of the body? Um, thank you for these uh, really important questions. Uh, I think there are alternatives, alternatives when rituals cannot be performed, but I don't think that people have yet um, come to, to, to terms with what has happened and probably it will only start to happen sometime uh, 
you know, in the future. And let's not forget that we're still very restricted in terms of movements and people have not been able to come this side and go that side. Um, one of the, uh, I didn't read the section where one of the uh, interviewees was, was anticipating how he, he was uh, mourning alone. And so he'll go and no matter in a year's time or so and have and meet his family in Zimbabwe and mourn with, with them. So is the, the process is not concluded, he feels until he doesn't meet um, the family. Now, people were doing, were taking decisions around, um, I think thinking of the future, no? Uh, thinking of how would they be best able to do what they couldn't do in the future when the restrictions are lifted, whether they could then bury them here, bury them there. Uh, there is something that probably will be happening, hopefully will be happening, uh, situations where somebody had died in the road, in a, in a road accident, and the spirit needs to be um, gathered. This is something that is going to be pending until they are able to come and, and visit the place of death and do the ritual to, to collect the, the soul that is otherwise uh, wandering. So I think it's in the process and probably um, that will, uh, people will be finding ways if, if they are able, right? Um, so it's uh, something to follow. Um, and regarding your second question, actually by thinking about the restrictions of, the, the restrictions of engaging sensorially with the body, it, it, it motivated me to start thinking, it's something very initial now, but I think I should go further on that. Um, the, the sensorial engagement with the body, the viewing it, and why everyone viewing is actually a moment of mourning and where everyone uh, sits around and, and, and look at that body and probably uh, reflects and thinks and, and, and prepare to say goodbye. The, the, the washing the other body, the dressing of the body. So that all definitely requires, um, um, requires to, be, to, 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 to reflect theoretically on the body and, and this um, need of engagement sensorily and, and the immanent uh, qualities of the death body, which I'm intending to further research. Um, I was going to say, if you want to also uh, ask for, for a tray, but I was also yeah. thinking how interesting those same questions would be to a tray's content where you were going and visiting these places before lockdown and these were rituals of, of joy and but very also sensory um, experiential and I was wondering that same question that you asked Lorena is how have those been replaced but uh, I'm, I'm, sorry, yeah. I'm sorry I'm cue jumping. <laughs> no I think I think that is a very good question and I wonder that and in addition to that something that you you brought into this you know yourself yourself as a researcher as a as a as a empathizing, I don't know if a believer and a practices and how uh, how can you transit from one to the other and where is the space of in between maybe where you're not this or that or you are a bit of that and that because what, what we like to divide things but we often this is not what happens in reality. Thank you. I'll answer Lorena's question first, um, which is that. Um, it is it is a been a struggle so i i definitely identify as a believer and which is why i first went to vrindavan the research emerged later i first went uh, as a believer to vrindavan and uh, then kind of cooked up this project and so i go there as a devotee and an ethnographer simultaneously so the struggle here as you as you rightly point out where is the in-between space the in-between space i think are uh, are where uh, are moments where I am um, second guessing my own faith, uh, where I, I go there to find joy and I do find joy in the, you know, in the dancing and the light and the, the sensory economy of the novel. And then when a priest says, oh, please give, um, you know, 1100 rupees to, a cow, to, uh, to give the cow to the temple. And as you, this is surrounding the political situation in India, 
where um, uh, cow cow related politics has become majoritarian politics surrounding the cow and 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 banning of cow meat etc has become uh, very prominent in the political public sphere so the gifting of the cow and the demanding of money to gift cows cows was uh, very uh, abhorrent to me and it comes out of the same phase the same phase that provides joy also provides moments of suspicion moments of abhorrence moments of irritation and so on and so forth so can i really call myself a pure believer uh, i don't know uh, but but what the the problem it poses is for research uh, when i go there as a researcher i find that i am consuming i am often too busy consuming the truth value of the faith that is being practiced so then then i have time or energy or uh, supposition um or or uh, 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 orientation to to uh, listen to people in a in an observant manner um so the, I, i do the observation but the observation takes a takes a um, second place takes a, a back seat when i'm too busy mm. consuming and participating and immersing myself in the truth value of this religious economy and uh, i i have to think more about the uh, in between place but uh, to me right now the in between place is the place where i i second guess my own faith that's where mm. that's where the in between place is uh, emerging uh, the philosophy of the body in in uh, brindavan is is very uh, i would say is very interesting with the body of the krishna uh, of the godhead and the body of the place the geographical body of the sacred geography are the same so you so a lot of people do what is called dandamati which is they they circumambulate the uh, entire town of vrindavan were uh, lying down they lie down when they get up they lie down again they get up and they circumambulate the entire town the peripheries of the town um and by doing that they are basically worshiping the body of krishna uh, by worshiping by lying against the uh, the body of the the, the land the, the landscape itself so the uh, so the question of the body kind of merges with the question of the, of the divinity one and the question of geography so the human body the the godhead's body and the physical body of the landscape to the, the three kind of straddle on the same continuum and uh, yeah yeah that's how that's the rest of thank you um that's also that uh, the matching of the physical body to the sort of that spiritual body is something that's that feeling of place and space is also so important and i was um so interested also in lorena's discussion about i wasn't expecting you to talk about migrants and that border crossing but it also feels like also it's 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 not transgressive but it is in a way it's kind of that there's something again where the physical crossing mm. mimics that spiritual crossing and the barriers are the same barriers mm. and and what we really are seeing is kind of like a body denied and you used trespassing as a very interesting word and i trace also sometimes that you're questioning are you a trespasser in this spiritual space um do you you know do you belong here as an academic um and uh, i'm sure you still have more questions for each other but i also wanted to ask within that is um lorena i wanted to ask you as a researcher you're working with very um it's a very emotional and quite difficult topic where you're talking to people and how do you find the place within yourself as a researcher to keep the empathy while maintaining that distance so you know or do you question yourself in in the same way as atres experiencing that her her research area but also immersing in it is you immerse yourself in your subjects but i was interested if you could um just talk briefly about your uh you as the researcher you as the person guiding the topic of conversation yeah um thank you for that it's actually very um, very difficult and my my approach in this case was to talk to people who were not as close to the person who died um removed a bit and i did talk to um 
directors of, of burial societies and uh, other people who deal with this and the drivers and so on, sort of approaching it from, from, from around. Uh, though a, a close view, but not the view that is completely uh, you know, overwhelmed by the loss. And I haven't asked, uh, I haven't talked to people who directly have lost somebody during this time. And if so, it will have to be uh, a bit later in time, like in a year's time, so on. Um, but it's very emotional. Yes, it's very emotional. The one thing I can say, and which I have, um, I, it, it really surprised me. I did not talk about the second driver I spoke to, who, who I was, as a driver, I didn't know who he was transporting and he did not tell me who he was transporting. And I couldn't get to him to, to really talk about how was it to drive along with the, with the coughing. And who was the person? And did you know the person? And, and then I, I ended up with this feeling that there's something strange here. And I said, thank you so much. And then I found out that he was the, the person who he carried was his brother. And he could not tell me, and he did what didn't want to tell me. So that is something that then I felt this is something I'm not even should try to capture because he was so unable to speak about that. And it, I didn't know he didn't want me to know, and I only knew afterwards. So it's something that yes, I I don't have all the. Um, but it's like that let, let me really feeling very heavy. Um, I'm going to hand over to Kayo now because we do have questions coming in. I have more questions, but I don't get to take up all the time. I'll add later if there's more time. So Kayo, you can take over now. Thank you, Nahama. Thank you, the panelists, for this amazing conversation. We have a few questions from the audience. Firstly, there are two questions from Kevin Webb who just shared with us a link from a, a Al Jazeera a reportage, which is basically talking about the stigma around people in India who are dealing with uh, COVID uh, bodies. So I was just wondering if, Lorena, if you can comment on, on that. I, I know that you have been speaking about all those restrictions around the uh, the human remains resulting from COVID, but uh, especially this issue of stigma. If you can uh, elaborate a little bit of, on that, because I think it brings another layer to the conversation. The other question uh, that Kevin had, had to do with um, the fact that when one is not allowed to, to grieve from the death of close relatives, and from the sudden loss, people usually go through uh, serious health, mental health issues and economic issues from these grieving family members. So Kevin is asking if for either of you, if in both uh, India or South Africa, there has been any kind of governmental support spe specifically targeting the issue of mental health, which I think it's quite... Uh, important part of, of this conversation or any kind of support to the people who are grieving. The third question is specifically to Atri from Krishna Swami is, um, is a very simple, but at the same time, very complicated question, which is if you think that faith and submission go together, perhaps uh, as a phenomenological state. So Who's, those are the questions we have so far. So please go ahead. Maybe I should answer um, and then leave um, the other more simple and complicated questions. <laughs> uh, the stigma is there and people are not, um, not only stigma uh, about those who handled COVID-19 death uh, and actually I had I I I I, I tried to in interview uh, funeral parlors finally I interviewed the one that uh, I know but many people were said um, that they were not allowed to speak 
They are not by the government. They were not allowed to give interviews and so on, and that contributes to this creation of of a, of a taboo around it and 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 fear and mystery and and uh, treating the bodies with with uh, this layer of suspiciousness, and um, so and uh, also another account of one of my of one PhD student who who was attending a funeral and the person uh, who died, died of COVID and his wife was also a COVID positive at the time. And she had not told anybody. So everybody had to leave, turn around and could not uh, attend uh, the funeral. So the, the stigma is, is, is preventing people from, from speaking out and preventing people, starting by the government forbidding people or I don't know the extent to which that is true, but every time I tried to talk to uh, funeral parlors, they would say, we're not allowed, we're not allowed. Treated as a state secret or something. Uh, so something we have to do with that and to and, and do the stigma and the damage that the stigma does to any condition really, um, to people who have that. Um, and, and then the second question, you know, there is, a, an, uh, 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 there is awareness on the mental health side of all of this and the initiatives that I know are initiatives put out by, by civil society. Uh, they are the ones that have been there um, trying to provide support with special lines to, uh, for people to call and so on. But it's a secondary issue. And I think, yes, why I ended up asking what could have been different because I think we need to think about this in a different way for future cases that we all know might well happen and how then we preserve um, and maintain as much as possible the possibility of that intimacy that I think is lost and the ownership of the death body and and with that preserve mental health issues that we're going to be facing now uh, okay I leave it there Um, thanks, Chris. Um, my contingent response to your question is that I see faith as a universal. And universals are um, things that will bathe all your uh, interpretation of the entire world. They, they can't be cloistered, they can't be categorized in one section of your life. They will, they will influence, they will uh, condition uh, your interpretation of the entire world in, and including your personal and public life. Um, so I don't see faith as necessarily something that demands a submission, but something that uh, because of its universalistic nature, um, if you submit to faith, um, there is no categorizing. I, I'll just put it, put it as that. that. You can't cluster it, you can't put it in a little box saying, this is my faith department. There can't be a faith department, faith belongs to all departments. And when that when it belongs to all departments, then there are clashes because other departments of your life may may believe other things, which it uh, calls wrong or or conflicts with and and so on and so forth. So in that conflict, I believe faith demands a submission. So so in case of conflict, when the when faith um, spreads over all quarters of life, um, in case of these conflicts between between uh, say a secular belief. And, and a belief of faith, um, where uh, someone asks you to do something for faith and you, your secular mind, rational, liberal mind, is saying, why should I do it? I'm an individual with, with um, you know, free faculties and so on and so forth. That's when the, the, that's the nature of the conflict there. And that's where faith would demand a submission. I'll just keep it at that. Thank you. Um, the one thing that I did want to add, which I also picked up listening to both of you, and I think is relevant, even though your um, the experiences that you were recounting were from 2019, Ajay, but you spoke very strongly about that thread of nationalism coming through, in um, even in devotion. And when I was listening to Lorena, I was also aware of this feeling of the state, the the hand of the state deciding what is and what isn't allowed. And we are coming up towards the end and we, we can't go too far over today. So um, unless anybody has any other questions, I was wondering if 
we could conclude by unfortunately moving out of the sacred and into, you know, not the mundane, but the bureaucracy, which is perhaps a little bit more malicious than the mundane. But I would be really interested to hear each of you maybe just give a short closing comment about either the, the role of the state at this particular time as this intermediate, as this intermediary in our sacred and spiritual spaces right now. Um, and if we can start with you, Atre, because of, and I think so relevant also with what's happening in India now, and then finish with Lorena, if that's okay. Um, any practice of Hinduism is uh, very likely to get quickly harnessed by the authoritarian Hindu right in India right now. And uh, my, my larger project around Vaishnavism and Krishna worship in Vrindavan is uh, geared towards um, excavating a Krishna sovereignty, which is not easily uh, harnessed by the Hindu right. The reason I say so is that there is another Hindu god called Ram, and uh, a lot of Hindu, the Hindu right, uh, the, the majoritarian political party that is in power in India today, they go on about Ram. But Ram is a king, he's a father, he's a husband. Krishna is none of those things, he's a lover. And so it's not easy to harness, uh, so the larger argument I'm trying to make is Krishna is less easy to harness for the purposes of the Hindu right than Ram. So he, he poses a certain kind of uh, difficulty or a paradox for the Hindu right. And uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. So I think I think that sexuality uh, is, is dominated by the nation state, but with Krishna sexuality, there's something mischievous about which slips out. I look forward to seeing that and, and hearing more about that research when, as you publish. Lorena? You're, you're muted. Just to say is that we are, for the first time in our lives, I think, experienced how the state can dominate every single area of our lives during COVID, right? With very high, in, I mean, good purposes to save the lives of everybody, but there's no single ambit in which the state hasn't entered really. And I think the, this is one way it's maybe most more most painful because uh, it's now or never. It's not that okay. I don't do this now. I'll do it next year. You you face with a death that needs to be resolved immediately. You you. You, you're, you're faced with, with a body that is decaying and needs to be buried or cremated or anything. And that is irreparable, that moment. And that is a loss, I think. Yeah. Thank you both very much. It did make me think also listening to that, the, the delays and the pausing of um, remembering prisoners from Robben Island in South Africa, who several of them who drowned trying to escape and this is long before the 1950s and the 1960s. So I'm talking about in the 1800s when the, the colonial state was imprisoning um, indigenous uh, warriors who were fighting against colonization. And also how sometimes generations, centuries later, the rituals had to be performed to quiet and to bring back the spirits that had been lost during that time. So the next challenge, I suppose, is how we reclaim these practices and these spaces in the wake of the pandemic, um, knowing how much we've lost. I just wanna thank both of you so much for really such thoughtful presentations and a thoughtful kind of discussion around that. And Kaya also thank you for facilitating that quest the questions. Thank you very much to everybody who joined us this afternoon. Um, the recording will be placed on YouTube and we will try and send you a link when that's done. Um, and you can also watch the recordings of all of the previous governing intimacy sessions on our YouTube page, because we're now big into social media, um, which is maybe one way to reclaim those rituals as best we can, is we are reclaiming the rituals of academia. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, this is now ended and uh, have a fantastic um, good afternoon. Thanks again for your time, Atre and Lorena. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you, everyone.